When Marvel announces that they're working on X-Men movies, my first thought is going to be, okay, well, which ones? Because there should be enough X-Men movies and shows for an entire phase of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. If we're doing things right, there'll be maybe a core X-Men movie, a proper Magneto origin, that Gambit movie Channing Tatum wants to make so badly, a Storm movie, a New Mutants series, a Hellfire Club series, an Excalibur series, an X-Factor series, a Star Jammers series, and then all of that will culminate in a big crossover where Genosha is destroyed or something like that. But okay, that probably won't be the case. Maybe Storm will pop up in Black Panther 3 with a soft origin story. Or maybe the Guardians of the Galaxy will run into Warlock. Not that one, another one. But we will more than likely start with one big simple X-Men movie. So I want to look at this one in three parts. First video, fan casting the heroes in an X-Men movie. The second will be fan casting the villains. And the third will be fan casting the giant sized X-Men editions. After my fan casting 4 video, I learned a few lessons, so I'm doing things a bit differently here. Still going character by character, but I'm going to spend about half the time discussing each character and their history, and then the other half on the actual casting. My thought process is it is very important to explain exactly how I see these characters, so even if you disagree with me, you'll understand where I'm coming from. I'm going to discuss some of their comic history and what character traits have persisted throughout that history. I'm also going to spend a bit of time on each character's previous castings in older X-Men movies. Also, each character is getting something called a highlight panel, which is a panel or a page from a comic that sums up that character very nicely. The heroes I want to focus on for this video are simple. I think Marvel will go back to basics. The first X-Men movie will be as simple as possible. That means I think we'll go back to the original first class of X-Men, lay a strong foundation. This means I bet the first team of X-Men will consist of Scott Summers, aka Cyclops, Jean Grey, aka Marvel Girl, Warren Worthington III, aka Angel, Hank McCoy, aka Beast, and Bobby Drake, aka Iceman, led by Charles Xavier. It's simple. They've never all been on screen together. We almost got it in X-Men The Last Stand, featuring Beast, Angel, and Iceman facing off against Jean Grey, but James Marston wanted to be a different movie, so Scott Summers died at the beginning of X3. Such a shame. Although, I mean, that movie had that has problems. The idea of a first class is familiar to audiences as the good movie, but the team in X-Men First Class only featured Beast and Xavier. Instead of Angel, we got Banshee, and instead of Cyclops, we got Havoc. Probably mostly because of the X-Men movie's inexplicable obsession with a continuity that wants nothing to do with them. My pitch here is for a first class that has been training together for years. They joined in their teens and 15 years has passed since then, but now they're forced out into the world to deal with a new brotherhood, and they are joined by a new member who we'll get to in a future video. The most important thing here is that the X-Men need to feel like a family. I don't think we ever quite got there in either series, partially because so many of the relationships in Gen 1, the 2000s ones, and then Gen 2, the 2010 plus X-Men, were romantic. Which is fine. Yeah, they're a family, but they're also a boarding school filled with teenagers, so things are gonna happen. But the chemistry between the characters needs to feel like cinema's most famous family, La Familia. They poke fun at each other, know each other better than anyone else on the planet, and care deeply about one another. It's an important balance to strike. So let's say our heroes are the original first class. That means we need to start at the top. So without any further introduction, welcome to the holiest of Nando V movie spaces, the Aculos Zone, named after an object from a movie nobody saw because it was very, very bad, but I made a cool video about it. They used a whiteboard, and that means if there's a whiteboard in the video, it takes place in the Aculos Zone, baby. First up, Charles Xavier. Professor X is a jerk. No, seriously, it's right here, you see? And Ariel, or whatever she was called at this point, is right. Professor X is a jerk. He always has been. But you try not being a jerk when you're the leader of an entire civil rights organization. And your best friend is always trying to kill you. And your stepbrother is possessed by an evil rage demon. And your sister is an evil psychic twin you killed in the womb. Yeah. The X-Men are a lot, this will be a theme going forward. Charles Xavier has a lot on his plate. He created Xavier School for Gifted Youngsters, a sanctuary for mutant children. He also organizes those children into a paramilitary fighting force with a jet that comes out of the basketball court. It's kind of like running for president. Just deciding that you're the person that should be president means you must have an enormous ego. But at its heart, everything Charles does is for the betterment of mutants kind. He wants the children he looks after, and every persecuted mutant of the world 
world to be able to live in peace with the humans. It is the only way, unless you have a sentient island, in which case that is also a, a decent way. My highlight panel for the professor is an image from the end of God Loves Man Kills, my favorite comic of all time. Xavier's own faith has been shaken by Stryker's actions, and Scott explains why Xavier's dream is worth fighting for. You brought us together to fulfill a dream, Charles, one born out of hope and the noblest of human aspirations, and we've sweated and bled, and some of us have died, to make it a reality. I'm not prepared to give up. The means are as important as the end. We have to do this right or not at all. Anything less negates every belief we've ever had, every sacrifice we've ever made. That's what's so important about him. He is defined by his students. Charles is smart, compassionate, headstrong, and full of secrets. We need someone who could be pretty much everything. Enough so that we question whether he's in the right, but charismatic enough to lead a movement. Previous versions. The original two Xaviers were excellent. Patrick Stewart is a godsend. Every X-Men fan knew he would be the perfect Charles. He was bald, British, stern, but fair, and he knows how to sit in a fancy chair. Boy, howdy. James McAvoy took some time getting used to, but I like where he ended up. Honestly, if McAvoy wanted to come back and give it another go, I'd be fine with that. He's close to the age I'm looking for here. I'm looking for someone in their late 40s, early 50s. My first four picks. I think Stanley Tucci could do it. Because hey, Professor X is only kind of British. In the comics, he grew up in Westchester, New York, but spent a lot of time in the UK, so we could do a mix of accents. And Tucci is a wonderfully fatherly actor. Maybe he's a little older than I'd like, and yes, I know he was in the first Avenger, Captain America, but hey, that guy is dead, and he's German. I don't think people would really get confused. Mark Strong could absolutely also play Xavier. Also bald, British, friendly but has the potential for menace or sinister menace because he was Sinestro. He's in his late 50s, just like Stuart was for X-Men in 2000. Sure, he works, but those are the easy ones, bald white dudes. I wanna go a little deeper. Or how about one of my reads, John Cho? He aged out of Mr. Fantastic, but that puts him right where I would want a Professor Xavier. But I don't know, he's a little too well known. Like people see him and think of Harold and Kumar or Star Trek or Searching if they are cool. Searching is a good movie with an insane ending, but anyway. Or what about the actor I see most fan casted for this role? David Ayelowo, the star of Selma, and also, I guess, Peter Rabbit too, according to his IMDb page. He has the chops. He is a proven talent as a civil rights leader. He's around the right age. He'd probably be 50 when they end up shooting. I could absolutely see it, but I'll be honest. I have one more who I thought of before I started coming up with these four. They're all really gutting for second because they are not my Charles. So here's my thought process. Let me take you back a couple of days. So I'm thinking, where on TV do you go to find a jerk? I came up with a couple of shows that are a good place to start. First one, obviously, Succession. We looked at some Roy's. We said, Kendall, no. Romulus, no. Connor, wow, no, absolutely not Connor. So, all right, nothing from Succession. So then I went and I looked at, oh, wait, Tom, played by Matthew McFadden, one of the breakout stars of the show from such films as Pride and Prejudice. And he's British. Could, no, there's just no way. He's... Well, he's around 47, which is right around the age I'm looking for, a 50-year-old Professor X. He's also popular, but not already bigger than the role. Yeah, this is my Charles, my ideal Professor X, Matthew McFadden. And hey, he even comes with some potentially excellent Moira McTaggart fan casts in Sarah Snook from Succession and Keira Knightley from Pride and Prejudice. That's a win. So Matthew McFadden is my Professor X. Now that we have Xavier, let's start looking at some students. Cyclops is Vision, not the character, the like the, the idea of Vision. Here's the thing, Cyclops is such a specific kind of guy. I think the two movie versions almost got it right, but in the end, I don't think either of them had the edge that I want from a Scott. And I'm not talking about darkness, no parents kind of edge, just I want a Cyclops that is always in charge. He never lets go. And if someone challenges him, he doesn't back down. I want a spine. Scott Summers is everything you expect from a leader. Scott has been quarterbacking the X-Men since the beginning, and while he's had his ups and downs, he is always there for the team. In fact, Scott is willing to do anything for any mutant. Not all of the X-Men agree with him in the movies, this usually ends up being Wolverine, but it goes way further than that in the comics. Anyone with an agenda or philosophy that doesn't match Scott's is going to hear from him. And Scott has the respect of every X-Men, and frankly, every mutant in the world. But also, 
If Scott believes he's in the right, he is not going to back down. He's incredibly stubborn. In the Avengers vs. X-Men event, Scott killed Professor Xavier because Xavier wanted to get between Scott and the Phoenix Force. Scott also became a revolutionary and left the Institute because he believed that was what he needed to do for mutant kind. He does what he thinks is right and makes the hard calls. For his highlight panel, I want to look at a page from Ten of Swords. Not going to get into the plot, I don't want to spoil it, it's a very fun book, but here is part of his speech to Xavier that I think is the perfect example of what I want from Scott Summers. I'm sorry, but I don't have the luxury of thinking of just one mutant anymore, Scott, or even a few, no matter how much they mean to me. I understand, sir. Just like I'm sure you understand, this vote doesn't change what I have to do. I know the difference between right and wrong, and I know that necessary evil has nothing to do with it. I know these things because that's how I was raised. Yes, it is. What are you going to do, son? I know that risking everything we've built for a few lives doesn't work for all of you. I understand you don't have the luxury of thinking that way. I really do. You form the Quiet Council to be the government of Krakoa. Well, the X-Men are its heroes, and we will save those who need saving, whatever the cost. And on top of all of that, he's a lover. The husband of Jean Grey and father of multiple ex-messiahs, Scott is hopelessly devoted to Jean, and their relationship is the core partnership of the team. Nothing can get between them except all the things that do, especially Emma Frost, and then that becomes a lot of fun. Overall, here's what I'm looking for. Bold headstrong, a leader, and if the actor is what a leader seems like, we can use that expectation to break down the trope, examine what being the front of this team would do to someone. Scott Summers can easily be the most interesting character in this movie. I also want my Scott to have a jaw that can cut glass. And age-wise, I think we're looking at someone in their late 30s, early 40s. I want a character who's been doing this for a little while. Previous versions. I liked James Marsden a lot. He didn't get nearly enough to do in those movies, but when he worked, he worked. His rivalry with Wolverine was tense and believable, he made decisions, executed plans, and then he got kissed to death. I have less of an opinion on Ty Sheridan. I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that in both movies he's in, the movies don't really seem that interested in him. It's all about the teachers, which is a shame, but that's always been the second generation's biggest problem. They couldn't get over the Mystique Charles Beast Magneto relationship, and that never really worked for me. So what I saw of Sheridan, I liked, but he never got the opportunity to win me over the same way that James Marsden did. Also, that kid from X-Men Origins Wolverine was fine. My first four picks. Listen, I have one of mine that I really like, so here's four other guys that could do it. Garrett Hedlund, Jensen Ackles, Sam Hugan, Charlie Hunnam. There, though they could all be Scott if we want, but the winner. It seems unfair to look to Luther, since the Umbrella Academy is so clearly influenced by the X-Men, and Luther is so clearly the Scott analog, but goddamn, Tom Hopper is absolutely perfect for Scott. He is everything I want from Cyclops, and because he's played Cyclops, but a monkey man, I've seen it before. I know Tom Hopper could do this. The scene where he knocks out Vanya and puts her in the soundproof room is peak Scott, making the difficult choice even though everyone hates it. It's perfect, and age-wise, he's a little older than I'd love, but I think he can play a little bit younger, and that's not that big of a problem. So yeah, Tom Hopper. Put it on the board. Jean Grey is pressure. She is the sole female member of the first class, one of two Omega level mutants on the original team. An Omega level mutant is one who the upper limit of their mutant power cannot be surpassed. They're as good as it gets. The other one on that team, funny enough, is Iceman. Jean is the powerhouse of whatever team she's on. Jean can read minds, control minds, and move objects with her mind. Compare that to Beast, who's just strong and athletic, or Angel, who can fly. Not in the same ballpark. And on top of that, Jean is the primary avatar of the Phoenix Force, a cosmic entity that is capable of destroying entire solar systems. For that reason, Jean Grey is at the center of many storylines, most notably the Dark Phoenix Saga. Jean is also the closest confidant of Professor Xavier. Every X-Man has a different relationship with the Professor, and Jean's is one of the most complicated, the only one above that being Scott, who, like I said, killed him once. Jean is at Xavier's side, helping Xavier solve big problems, manage the Xavier Institute, and she shares the curse of being able to read minds, knowing what people really think. All of what I have just described, 
puts an unbearable amount of pressure on Jean Grey. She has an almost biblical destiny to live up to, and is in control of an amount of power that few other mutants can understand. Everyone is fighting to control Jean, so while she's a crucial member of the X family, she is also isolated. No one understands her. Her one lifeline has always been Scott Summer, the perfect X-Men couple, the mutant homecoming king and queen. And yet, there's something wrong with that relationship. They're happy together, but it's a little too perfect. And that pressure to be perfect sometimes drives Jean to Logan and Scott to Emma. They're a tragic couple brought together by the X-Men, but eventually destroyed by it. Although it's comic, so they always get back together eventually. Jean is also a mother, but never the way you'd expect. A clone of hers gave birth to Cable, the time-traveling techno-organic pouch-clad badass. Then in another timeline, Jean is also the mother of Rachel Summers, a powerful telepath from a dystopian future. And then Jean's DNA was also used to create X-Man, who is just mutant Jesus from another timeline. So while Jean is the mother of some of the most powerful mutants in existence, they're not actually her children. She didn't give birth to them. She gets all of the pressure of being their mother, but with none of the experience. They just show up. She also fills the role as the de facto mother of the group as the original female X-Man, and that role is difficult for Jean to live up to. She needs to behave perfectly as an example, which is something that all of the original X-Men struggle with, but Jean more than almost anyone else. And when that pressure becomes too much to bear, Jean lashes out. She goes bad. Jean Grey, aka Marvel Girl, is complicated. For her highlight panel, I want to look at Uncanny X-Men 300, when Jean goes full Omega and annihilates a mutant named Seamus Mellencamp. My worst nightmare? I'm just myself. Not the Phoenix, not Madeline Pryor, not even Marvel Girl. I'm just Jean Grey, one of the most powerful size on the planet. The frightening thing is, in my dream, I'm not afraid to lose myself in my mutant ability. I cut loose. Completely. Also, gotta bring up the fact that Jean Grey is a redhead, and I think visually, that's important. It helps her stand out among characters like Kitty or Rogue who have similar silhouettes in the same uniform. It also creates a strong contrast between girl next door Jean Grey and evil supermodel Emma Frost. I want that present here, especially since one of my favorite versions of X-Men is the Grant Morrison X-Men, and that plays a big role in the development of that comic. Previous versions. Oh boy. Both Jeans had a fun first movie where we really got to enjoy them as part of the team and I wish it ended there. But then, Famke had some decent moments in X2, but spent almost all of X3 or X-Men The Last Stand scowling. Overall, I enjoyed her performance, but a lot of her plot cast her as little more than the object of Logan's affection, which is a shame. And then, after X3 crashed the franchise, they brought back the writer of X3 to direct a new movie because I'm assuming he saw some producer hit a kid with his car, kidding, kidding, or am I? And that guy just remade X3 as Dark Phoenix. It rushed Sophie Turner's gene to Phoenix God Mode at a pace that would make Pietro jealous. Or Callisto. Remember Callisto? She was in X3. That's Callisto, and she has super speed. Neat. My first four picks. So I'm not only looking at redheads here, but I do see that as a good place to start if we want to narrow down the list of 30-ish year old female actors. For instance, Evan Rachel Wood has experience playing a messianic figure who straddles the line between human and the next step in evolution. She could do it. Or how about Jane Levi? Here she is on Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist using her mind control on a crowd of people. I assume I have not seen that show. Just kidding, I have seen it. I know it's like a song. She's doing like song and dance numbers, I think. I actually haven't seen it, but yeah. Hey, could Anna de Armas play Jean? Maybe, although she might be better suited to play another mutant down the line, who we'll talk about in a future video. Is Emma Watson too big for this role? Maybe, I'm honestly not sure, but she's been at the center of a mega franchise before and she knows how to act alongside a CGI beast, so, you know, worth considering, but the winner. Rose Leslie comes to mind as an excellent red-headed actor in the right age range with the right attitude, and she's the lead of the big hit of 2022, Death on the Nile. There she is on the poster, nobody else in that movie, just her. I really liked Rose Leslie on Game of Thrones, where she played Egret, who is both the girl with the wild side and sort of the wildling girl next door. She's down to earth, relatable, confident, tragic, romantic, and conflicted. That is Jean Grey to a T. But if Rose Leslie does not get that, role, I want her for Siren in an X-Factor show. I love the X-Factor Investigations comic and she would be perfect. But she should also be Jean. Angel is perfection. Warren Worthington III is rich. He is handsome. He is confident. And his power makes him a literal angel among men. He's not 
quite a rich jerk. Morally, I'd say Warren's usually on the right side of the issue, but he doesn't take orders well, especially from Scott Summers, especially when they're young. He's happy being part of a team as long as he gets to do whatever he wants. He's spoiled, but not beyond saving. Warren is brave, bold, and beloved. The cool middle child, the mutant Uncle Jesse. And he will also have a dramatic fall from grace in the future. After his de-winging and presumed death, Angel falls in with the wrong egomaniacal mutant warlord and literally becomes death. The apocalypse story should play out, but not at the bizarre pace that it did in X-Men Apocalypse. Angel's transformation into Archangel is tragic, and that only works if the Angel we start with has it all. So more than any other member of the team, Angel has to be a stud. He is everything you expect from a superhero. I think we've got plenty of room to play around here. Race is not important. I'd like a tall Angel. He should probably be the tallest one here, but overall I want confidence, charm, and maybe a little arrogance. For his highlight panel, I want to look at Angel's introduction in X Factor 1. You can see him confidently flying through the air. The next morning, high above the Rocky Mountains of New Mexico, one of the wealthiest men in the world flies. Under his own power. He is Warren Worthington III, entrepreneur, socialite, and the object of more than one woman's desire. But there's also another side to this man. He is also known as the Avenging Angel, mutant, former X-Men, and until very recently, member of an elite supergroup known as the Defenders. However, with the sudden demise of that team, the Angel's priorities have narrowed. All that concerns him now is the rebuilding of his mountain chateau and the pursuit of purely personal pleasures. Previous versions, man, did the original X movies do Angel dirty. In X-Men The Last Stand, he just sort of showed up in the beginning as a tortured kid trying to hide his identity from his father. That was good. And then he disappears for a very long time, saves his dad, and then that's the last we see of him. Then, fast forward to X-Men Apocalypse, he's killing the blob in cage fights. He joins Apocalypse because one of his wings gets singed and then he explodes. Not good. Very not good. Especially not for a first class mutant. My first four picks. This is tough because I want fancy hunk. Let's talk about John David Washington. I'm not the biggest fan of Tenet, but I think he had a thankless role. I mean, protagonist. Come on. So I think he deserves another look. And I like him in Black Klansman. Why not have him here? How about Henry Golding, Snake Eyes' his own? He is charming. He can play rich, handsome. He's all you need. I think he's going to be free since I don't think we're getting too many more Snake Eyes movies. Hey, if he wasn't already Spider-Man, I wouldn't mind Andrew Garfield here. Might be a little too likable now, but like look back to Social Network and you can see a lot more of that anger, that fire. Or how about Marijuana Cons? Zari, hot Jafar, grasping at straws, but I think he has the spoiled rich kid vibe. The winner. My ideal pick is Regé Jean Page from Netflix's Bridgerton. I think he's got the, well, he's about as much of a stud as we have right now. And screw it. Make Angel British. Let him use his natural accent. I like the idea that the X-Men are kind of from everywhere. Maybe Xavier even knows the Worthingtons from his time in the UK. Regé is charming, handsome, and has what I would call angel energy. It's perfect. Bobby Drake is young. He is the younger brother of the first class, a little too eager, sort of a joker, and he constantly feels the need to prove himself among some of these other members. It's pretty simple, honestly. Now, Bobby has a very complicated history when it comes to his sexual orientation, and I'm honestly not sure what direction they should go with this one. When he was introduced, Bobby was your typical 60s teenage boy, chasing after cute girls, always the life of the party. He dated Kitty Pride for a bit, also had flings with Cloud, Rogue, Polaris, and even Mystique. Then, in a story from 2015, from this book, a version of Bobby came from the past to the present day. And then Jean, from the past, read present day Bobby's mind and learned that he's straight, which is new to her because her version of Bobby is gay. It turns out Bobby's always been a closeted gay man and some of those flings I mentioned were with shapeshifters so you can see some hints there in older material. I think that dynamic could exist in this story. Maybe first movie he's straight but we saw some hints that he isn't quite sure about that. Then in the second movie Bobby comes out. Simplify the complicated comics arc. For that reason I think it's worth considering specifically gay actors for the role. It's the same thing as Ben Grimm. Iceman is the highest profile gay superhero, so it would be cool for the character to be represented publicly by a gay actor, especially since part of his arc involves coming out. So it's a bonus. I don't necessarily think it should be a litmus test, like Ultron said on The Office, sexuality is a spectrum, it's complicated, and we don't know what's going on inside any person's head, so, you know, it's a bonus if the actor is gay, but not a requirement. It also just kind of helps to narrow down this field of 20 to 25 year old actors, because that 
there are so many of them. And I'm willing to play around here as far as age is concerned. Plus, lots of actors play younger than they are, like Tobey Maguire in the first Spider-Man. When they filmed the high school scenes, he was 26. Yet, through the magic of cinema, we were all able to believe he was 25. So I'm looking for a little brother, someone with an excited energy who's willing to take on the world as a superhero, and also he's got some things to discover about himself. From his highlight panel, I want to look at a page from a book called X-Men Season 1, where Bobby shows up in the danger room wearing, instead of his usual outfit, just a big block of ice around his waist as a joke. What do you guys think? Extreme weather athletic underwear. I'm thinking something like Cheek Chillers by Drake. This is before Jean is introduced to the group, so she shows up. He's super embarrassed. It's like a silly little prank he did. That's all you need. That's what I want from Bobby. Previous versions. I never bought Iceman in the original trilogy. I think, you know, he was in some great scenes, like the coming out scene or the assault on the X-Mansion, which, you know, they were both in X2, and X2 is the best movie, so of course he'd be in some of the best scenes. But my problem came with the fact that he just never felt fun. He was always just, like, brooding or hanging around in the background. There was one Iceman moment that really worked for me. Just one. This one. Freezing the fire was the kind of jokey playfulness that I expect from a young Bobby. And it isn't like a, oh, he's exactly like the comic so the movie is bad kind of thing. It's just this character fills a very specific role that I don't think Gen 1 Bobby did. Then we never got Nice Man in Gen 2, which is kind of a shame, but then considering Angel and Psylocke, maybe we dodged a bullet. It's part of why Bobby's so important here. General audiences aren't too familiar with the character, so we need a good actor to set that tone. My first four picks. I don't know a ton about Kyle Allen, but West Side Story is a movie. I don't know. This is another one where I picked a winner before I had the other four, so sure. Kyle Allen. He was the male lead in West Side Story. No other male actor in that movie. Check it out. Here's the poster. Maybe one of these guys is him. I haven't seen it yet. It is not streaming. How about Alex Wolf? He's great in Hereditary. Phenomenal in Pig. Watch Pig if you haven't. And he was in Old. You remember Old? That movie where the dumbest people on the face of the earth go to the beach that makes you old and mostly die there because they're all stone cold dummies. You know, old. Anyway, he was he was pretty good in that, so that's something. Also willing to throw in Joe Keery. A lot of you guys had him pegged for Johnny Storm, as evidenced by the comment section in my Fantastic Four fancast video. See? I read the comments. And while I think he would be a good Johnny, I think he'd also make a solid Bobby. He's carefree, he's childish, but he's able to be serious. We'll get to number four in a second, but first, the winner. My pick here is Justice Smith. In Detective Pikachu, he was all kinds of dorky. Felt like someone who was in over his head. Played a very solid, awkward teenager. But since then, Smith has also played characters with more confidence. So he can come at it from all angles. He's a great younger brother. Also happens to be gay, so that works too. However, when I was researching Smith, I found a short he did a couple of years ago, and it didn't change my opinions of him, but it introduced me to another actor named Graham Patrick Martin. And this guy is the spitting image of Bobby Drake. Liked him in the short. Haven't seen him in much else, but just wow, he looks like Bobby Drake. I'm still gonna go with Smith for now. He's a proven talent. People like him. However, if Justice Smith were unable to fulfill his duties, I would be happy with someone like Graham Patrick Martin. Also, I'm sure there's a ton of kids from Euphoria that could also be this character. I don't know. I haven't watched that show. By now, you may be thinking, okay, hey now, that's half the team played by black actors, and all five of the original X-Men were white. To that I say, kick rocks, it isn't the 60s anymore. These are the best actors for the role, and guess what? I've got one more. Also, this Bobby is not the best drawing, not because I think it's bad, just because like I noticed when I was pretty far in, I was like, oh, this just looks like some kid. Like, there's not a whole lot of features when you take away his face and don't put color into it, and that's a problem with all of the Bobby Drakes, so yeah. The drawings though, a lot of fun. I'm having, I'm doing some good drawings here. This is taking forever, and maybe this won't continue in the future, but I do enjoy it. I don't know, we'll see. If this video does well, if you like the drawings, comment, tell me in the comments, share the video with all of your friends, and then I'll do that in the future, and if not, Maybe I won't. Who knows? Beast is a contradiction. Hank McCoy is a unique figure. He's one of Marvel's biggest nerds. I want to say like seventh smartest person alive. Yeah, Howard, that changes all the time. But also, unlike Reed Richards or Tony Stark, Hank McCoy is also, you know, he's like a big boy. He's a large dude. His actual mutation is that he's just super strong and athletic. The whole super genius thing is just a coincidence. But Hank is both sides of the coin, the brains and the brawn. He's also a little too curious for his own good. Something of a mad scientist, toiling away in his lab, inventing new machines or cures or what have you. He's also sort of an older brother to Iceman and has a friendly relationship with the rest of the first class. My highlight panel for Hank comes from Grant Morrison's new X-Men where Hank is getting in a fight with Cassandra Nova in Xavier's body. Nova taunts Hank about his lack of humanity and he comes back with this great line about the contradiction that exists at the core of his character. Every day I wake up and I look in the mirror 
and I feel like more of a monster than the day before, every day. So why not just rip off your face with my teeth? Shall I tell you? Because I believe in art and music and literature and reason. Because I don't believe in the law of the jungle. Previous versions. I was never quite on board with Nicholas Holt as Beast in the Generation 2 X-Men. I think partly it has to do with his general detachment from the rest of the team. Beast barely spends any time with the kids. It's all Beast and Mystique and Charles and Magneto, but not Cyclops or Jean. Like, it's like Beast is in his own little movie. And part of the charm of Beast is how he's able to be a kind mentor to the younger students who don't know what's going on. I also hated the fact that he was largely not Beast. Like, I get it. The makeup is expensive and time consuming, but you kinda gotta do it. It's part of the character. Past a certain point in his history, Hank always looked like Beast. And while it definitely creates obstacles for him, Hank is able to take them in stride, and he is a perfect example of a mutant who seems dangerous on the outside, but has a heart of gold. Kelsey Grammer, aka Darius Emmanuel Grouch III, aka The Rumble, was a terrific older Beast. A bit disagreeable for my taste, but overall felt like the closest we've seen to a proper on-screen beast. My first four picks. Do we do we really have to do this? Sam Richardson should play Beast. Are we are we done? Can we go home? I mean, I live here. This is my home. But it's it's just it's the star of After Party, Detroiters, I think you should leave, that Werewolf's movie. He's proven that he's ready for the big leagues. He's a nice guy with a bit of an edge, seems very smart, but also he's just a big guy, like he's got the right frame, which is tough to find, especially in these days. Now, there is an issue when it comes to the trope of black people being represented by non-human creatures. Frequently in media, for one reason or another, black actors tend to end up in roles where they are turned into something else. Think Princess and the Frog, Soul, or Spies in Disguise. It happens more than it should based on just the law of averages. So turning Beast into a beast, it's not hard to see the problems there, especially since he becomes comes like a literal beast. You could say, well, if you are counting out a qualified black actor for the role because of his race, isn't that also bad? And that's where this becomes a mess. Plus, this is the X-Men. Beast is not even the most beastly, furry, blue acrobat on the team. Tons of team members transform or are just, you know, strange looking. That's the point. And also, Sam Richardson, in an interview, said that he thinks he's a good pick. So, you know, who am I to disagree with him? I think my ideal solution to this problem is just let Sam Richardson be Beast, but give him at least one movie before he turns blue. After all, that is not how Hank started. Like in the first class movie, the blue fur is result of a mad science experiment gone wrong. Beast was on the X-Men for nearly 10 years in the comics before the change. So I say, give him some time as just non-blue Hank. We had plenty of on-screen Beast in the movie. We can wait a little bit with this one. Conclusions. So these are my first six. Matthew McFadden as Professor X. Tom Hopper as Cyclops. Rose Leslie as Jean Grey. Ray, Regé Jean Page as Angel, Justice Smith as Iceman, Sam Richardson as Beast. Let me know what you think. Use the hashtag X-Men Fancast so I can see your ideal first classes. We will get to the giant-sized X-Men like Storm, Wolverine, Kitty Pride, and all of those other additions later, but before that, we need to talk about the villains, some of my favorite characters in all of comic books. So, that will be in part two of this series. I cannot wait. And one thing I really want this version of Beast to do is read. Every time you see him, I want him reading a new book. And right before a big fight, he throws it away like in the animated series intro. And if he wants to, Beast can also listen to audiobooks, perhaps on this video sponsor, Audible. So for this spot, I'm going to recommend a book, a wonderful book that I just started rereading on Audible. Originally, I read it in college. It should be essential reading for any comics fan. It is called The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay by Michael Chamon. It's a fictional story about two cousins who basically create their universe's version of Captain America and go through the golden age of comics as proxies for real comics pioneers like Jack Kirby, Will Eisner, Stan Lee, and a ton of others. Guardian put it at 57 on their list of the 100 best books of the 21st century. Not just like books about comics, all books. It was 57. It is an excellent read. And you can find that audiobook and thousands of others on this video's sponsor, Audible. You guys know Audible. It is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment. Besides audiobooks, they also have podcasts, mostly nitpicking. My podcast happens to also be on Audible. As an Audible member, you get one credit each month, good for any title in their premium selection, and they are yours to keep forever. 
and you get full access to their Plus catalog. A lot of cool stuff there. You can try Audible for free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash Nando V Movies or text Nando V Movies to 500 500 and check out Cavalier and Clay. Honestly, really excellent book. Thank you so much to everyone who supports the channel on Patreon, listens to my podcast, mostly nitpicking, and follows me on Twitter. Stay safe. I'll see you next time for part two.